What? Blah, blah, blah. Wow. Are you kidding me? No. I told you. Yeah, stop. right. <laughs> Sorry. Do it again. Yes. Perfect. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Man, two weeks in a row, we're on a roll. <laughs> Next week will be, uh, what, well, we'll go be par for the year, and then the fourth week will be like set new world record, right? It's crazy. So anyway, it's good. Uh, so thank uh, Eric and filling in for Eric, and he's doing the guest uh, what a service host, the soundboard at the same time for Ricky and the band. Sounds like it's uh, like a talk show uh, group, right? And Johnny's going to come out here in a moment. Uh, so anyway, pr- appreciate their hard work and all that stuff. So it's good to see you guys. We expanded to one more service. So we're glad that you're here today and we'll see how things go as we continue to move forward. If you didn't get an outline and you want one, you can raise your hand and one of our fine gentlemen will come and uh, give you an outline. So we got an outline neater up here. And then if you have your app, you can always download, a, uh, download the, uh, it online. So Anyway, fill it out, so he'll be here in a moment, so as we get ready to move forward. You guys excited about today? All right. So, I don't know, maybe maybe he's going to go and print it. Oh, there he goes. All right. Sorry, John, didn't mean to catch you (laughs) flat-footed. So, anyhow, so uh, one right up here. So, anybody else need one? Cup of coffee, oh, we can't do that. Donut, we already ate those. <laughs> so anyhow, all right, so here, here we go. We're going to look at a beautiful picture as kind of a metaphor for what we're going to talk about today. So we started a new series last week on emotionally healthy relationships, and it kind of got the idea started coming maybe a few, few months ago. Um, as we recognize that, uh, you probably read the same statistics I've read, that about 30, uh, there's a, a 34% higher divorce rate or people applying for divorces during this season than a year ago. And obviously because there's the, you know, everyone's staying home and working from home and all that other type of stuff, there's a lot of issues going on, a lot of relational issues going on, depression is up, uh, is high, anxiety is high, illegal drugs, legal drugs, uh, psychiatric drugs that are being uh, given out by doctors is actually high, alcoholism is high, purchase of alcohol is high. All these things are taking place in our, in our culture that's unique to what's going on in our, in our life. And so I wanted to really kind of speak into the relationship part of it. Um, this series, which is five weeks, we'll, we got th- uh, this week and four, uh, three others, and then we're going to start a new series on hope, and we're going to look at the miracles of Jesus because I think a lot of the problems that are taking place psychologically, relationally in our world is because of people have lost hope. And so we need to kind of get back to Jesus central and Jesus focused uh, in our life as we, as we begin to move forward. So I want to give you the visual of the iceberg. Now, isn't that a beautiful iceberg? Yeah, yeah three people like it. So all everyone else goes, go back to Google and find another one. So I wanted to use this as a visual. Um, I, as I started to kind of use it, I thought, okay, and I started reading about icebergs. You've heard the term, the tip of the iceberg, right, which goes back to, was it 1912 when the Titanic uh, hit an iceberg, and the idea is that 10% of the iceberg is above waterline and 90% is below. And there's actually, that, that's actually true because it has to do with the buoyancy, the weight, and all this other type of stuff. So statistically, that's true. Regardless of the size of the iceberg, 10% is above water, 90% of it is below water. And in my studies, here's what else I found, that the largest iceberg that they've ever taken a picture of from a satellite was in 2000. It was 183 miles by 23 miles. Right, and that is ginormous, right? That's a, that's a big ice cube floating, uh, floating around. And so what I want to do is use this as a visual for us when it comes to our emotions and our, our life. The 10% of our life that is above the waterline typically is not where our, re- our relational problems are at. It's the 90% that's below the waterline where our emotional, relational problems and struggles are at, okay? By nature, we want to address the top 10%. 
Very rarely do we want to address the bottom 90% in our life. And so we do what they, the phrase is, you know, uh, rearranging the chairs on the Titanic. The Titanic is sinking, and we're concerned about it, and so we're rearranging the, the, where the chairs are at in our life. Well, relationally, we do that as well. When we're experiencing kind of train wrecks in our relational life, what we end up doing is we're not focused on the 90% that's below waterline. We kind of go out and we rearrange the chairs on the deck, somehow soothing ourselves, thinking that everything is okay. Because to go down deep into our emotional life can, can be a bit of a struggle, right? And so today isn't about necessarily giving you answers and you leave here with the magic bullet, but really kind of giving you questions that you need to begin to ask yourself so that you're able to experience wholeness in your life. As I said in the, sec- the first service, you know, I believe that God sent Jesus to die on the cross, not so that someday we would just go to heaven, we, we will someday go to heaven, but he also desires for us to walk on this earth whole and complete. And part of that is recognizing what's below our, in our life, really diving in, looking at it, and allowing the Spirit of God to heal us, to make us whole, to purify us in, in our life so that we're able to have healthy relationships with, with the folks Um, around us, okay? Y'all with me on that? Otherwise, the 90% that we don't address, and all pun intended here, creates shipwrecks (laughs) in our relationships, all right? And what we end up doing is we end up shifting the blame from ourself to everyone else. And so this is typically what happens, and I'm sure it's none of you in this service or the ones who are watching in, online, it was the one in the first service, they were the ones that had all the trouble, right? But what, what ends up happening is people start having trends in their life. It's like, I got a bad boss, I got a bad you know, neighbor, I got a bad coworker, I got a bad this, I got a bad that, and, and there's all these bad right, relationships. And the common denominator is you, right? It's you. And so you have to look at your life and really kind of assess it and make sure everything is whole. So in your outline, as we begin to work through today, the very top of your outline is unresolved emotions don't die. Okay, we want them to die, but they don't die. You bury them alive, but they're still going to surface at some point in the relationship. Something is going to pop up at that inopportune moment, you know, in that moment of whatever it is. All of a sudden, it begins to kind of pop up in our life. And so we need to make sure that we address the 90% that's below the waterline. Big idea through the series is to learn to love the people around us. Isn't that simple? Come on, church. Come on. You can talk back here, right? Nothing is more important as a Christ follower than to grow in our ability to love, right, and to love others, right? And and the idea comes from uh, Jesus when he's asked, hey, put everything together in kind of a, a simple statement, and Jesus says in Matthew 22, verse 37, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And don't we all wish that it ended right there? Because that's pretty simple, right? To love God, he died on the cross for us, he sent the son, I mean the whole bit, it's hard not to love God. And and here's the struggle. This is the first and greatest commandment, verse 39, and the second one is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. And that's tough, isn't it? Right? That's tough. In fact, as I said last week, that some of our spiritual or lack of spiritual growth in our life happens because we got the first part of this verse down. We love God with all of our heart. We just struggle with loving our neighbors as ourselves. And as a result, spiritually, you're not growing because this isn't an either or, this is both. Right? This is both in our life that we need to love God with all of our heart. And our neighbor as ourself. And so here's the question that we're going to ask ourselves. And I wanted to put it on here because I know what our temptation is. Our temptation is to say, man, I wish so-and-so was here to hear today, right? Or I hope somebody's watching online. And so I wanted to kind of stop us and shake us and give us this question. Here's, here's the question for us today. How are you contributing to the disappointment you may be experiencing in your relationships? Right? You. Because, see, it's easy to say that it's them. But sometimes we have to look at ourselves. In fact, let me just say this that if you're not healthy, you're not going to have healthy relationships. 
regardless of what the other person's situation is. If you're not physically, spiritually, and emotionally healthy, you are not gonna have healthy relationships because it's impossible, right? It's impossible. And so we need to make sure that we're looking um, at ourselves, all right? Y'all with me so far? All right, if you don't talk back, the service is gonna be really long, all right? So you're gonna start talking back? Yeah, all right, yeah. All right, yeah, and I I have a whole bunch of weeks where I didn't speak in front of groups of people, so I got lots of words, all right? So so here here is the first, this is uh, number two of the skills. Last week, we learned to clarify expectations. This week, we learn, which is number one, to become self-aware, all right, to become self-aware of our life. All right, you got that written down? Now let's have a little fun. About 27 years ago, when I was six and I was a senior pastor here at this church, <laughs> um, I, the church was growing. We were reaching young fo- families and we, our kids' ministry was kind of growing. We had a kids' ministry. It was, it was like okay. It was run by some volunteers. And I thought, well, you know, we, we need to just get some focus in it. And so we had a couple in our church that was very talented with kids, very creative in their teaching and all that other stuff. And so I wanted to kind of encourage them and help them to maybe come on staff part time. At that time, the church was really small, but to really kind of help our children's ministry. And so I set up an appointment to go visit with them. Great couple, went over there, shared my heart, shared my vision, talked about the importance of kids coming to Christ at an early age, you know, that God would spare them from the heartache of the world and all this other kind of stuff. And, and the meeting went great. Said, hey, I don't want an answer now. I want you to pray about it in a week or so. You know, I'll get in touch with you to kind of figure out where you're at and see where we're at. And so, you know, everything went well. Got out, walked out, climbed down the stairs, got in my car, opened up the car door, sat down. And now, I normally don't do this, and some of you are going to be surprised because you think, oh, yeah, it's vanity, vanity, vanity. But I ended up flipping down the mirror and the visor, and I had a Ford Taurus at that time, and it had a light on the, on the mirror, you know what I'm saying? And so I popped it up, and I have no idea why I did this, to be honest. And inside my nose, hanging out, Visible for all to see. You know where I'm at? You want me to say it, don't you? The kids in the first service wanted me to say it. Because last week they learned that the unforgivable sin is melted ice cream. This week they learned Pastor Dan had a booger hanging out of his nose. Right? So now we can all go home, right? So, so then you did, have, have, you ever had a, have you ever had a wardrobe malfunction, you know, or something like that and been around people? Come on, raise your hand. It's, it's free. Okay, it's freeing. You feel like, you know, you're, you're whole now. And so, so you, I'm in the car and I'm sitting and then your mind starts playing with it, you know, and I'm thinking, well, you know what? Maybe it wasn't visible the whole time. Maybe when I was walking down the steps, I kind of stepped down and blew hard and out it came, right? And you're going through all these different e- thoughts in your mind as to why. And to this day, I've never had the courage to ask them whether, whether it was visible or not right? Now, they took the position. They did a great job, but, but I never asked them, and, and, and I, I thought, you know, that was one of those kind of embarrassing moments, but let's, let's get real here. It's one thing to have something hanging out your nose or a wardrobe malfunction, but it's another thing to not be self-aware of destructive behaviors that you have in your life that's the 90% below waterline, that everybody else knows, but you don't. And it's not that you don't know, it's just that you just don't want to look for it and you don't want to find it. And the destruction that it creates in our life is horrible. See, it isn't something that we can laugh about and go, oh, Pastor Dan had a you know, thing hanging out of his nose. But it's destructive. And it tears apart the people that we love the most. Right? And so this idea of not becoming self-aware, of really looking down in our life and figuring out what is going on in our life. How are we able to have healthy habits and healthy emotions in our life? And how are we able to live them out in our life in front of folks? And that's really what today is. It's not a magic bullet, but it's really for you to look down and give some, some tools or some suggestions of how you look down into your life to really figure out what's going on. In your outline, to be self-aware equals knowing your emotions and your motivations. 
right? To be self-aware means that you know your emotions and your motivations. In other words, you know why you feel. You know why you do. You know why you respond, right? And when we're able to connect and grab a hold of the reason why we're doing something and we invite Christ into it and we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our life, he brings wholeness and healing in our life. But we have to be willing to go that 90% that's below the waterline to really look at what's taking place. So let me give you some, some thoughts here. There are three types of folks from what, what we understand. Letter A in your outline is we have the folks that are resistant and they don't want to go to that 90% that's below the waterline. They don't want to get touchy-feely. You know, it's too difficult. They, they just don't want to go there. And so what they want to do is they want to keep things just factual. And what I call in premarital counseling, it's the news report. You know, tonight's garbage. You got to feed the dog. Don't forget your homework. I got to make lunch. Who made the coffee? Right? It's all factual. It's not really, there's no deep conversation that's taking place. And so the folks that are resistant, that's where they're at. They they, they just don't, they just kind of want to pretend like everything is going okay, all right? Then you have letter B in your outline, and those who are are resigned, and, and that is the folks that just come to the point in their life and they just say, that's just who I am. If you're going to love me, then you're just going to have to accept me. That's just the way that it is. That, that these fits of rage, that whatever that I'm doing in my life that's unhealthy, that's destructive, you're just going to have to embrace me. You're just going to have to take me for that. That's how God made me. All right? Air quotes. You with me, church? Yes. Letter C is those who are, have the idea of resolved, and that is really where I want to encourage all of us to be. And that is where we're really willing to recognize that the relationships around us are important enough to go deep into our life, that 90% that's below sea level, and really figure out what makes me tick, what ticks me off, what's helping me, all those kinds of things, and that we're resolved and we're willing to do that. All right, And so you just have to kind of map out where you're at. Which of those three are you? Maybe you're a little bit of a combination on some of those. Now, Jesus ultimately is our example. And I want to share with you four types of emotions that Jesus had. This isn't all of them, but for sake of time, I want to lay out four. Because here's what we're going to learn. We're going to learn that it isn't that you have areas of your life that you have anger Because anger is actually an emotion that God gives you. But it's how you process that anger and what that anger looks like on the outside in front of the people that you care about, all right? And so these emotions that we wrestle with, it isn't isn't that they're sinful, they are sinful on how you respond and how you react. Are, are, you, are you with me on that? And let, let's just kind of walk through. I think you'll, it'll, it'll become a little bit more clear. So in uh, letter A in your outline, number two in your outline, is Jesus was self-aware, so he's our model. We certainly want to follow him. He's our example. Letter A in your outline is that Jesus felt anger. All right? Jesus felt anger. And so we oftentimes think of Jesus as being compassionate, full of mercy, patience, all this other stuff. There's times where he was just flat out angry, right? He was angry. And the, and the, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees really got him going. If you want to know kind of what group of people to get Jesus charged up about, that was just simply it. Bring in the religious leaders because they had taken the Ten Commandments and they had uh, applied all these new regulations. And here's the way the religious leaders were in those days. They had rules for you, but they had their own set of rules for them. So you had the burden of all these things that you had to do, but they had a complete separate set of rules. And so they took the Old Testament, they added all these other laws on it, and in Jesus' words, it became such a heavy burden on them that it literally crushed people, it drove them down into despair. And so Jesus responds, and so in your outline, Matthew chapter 23, verse 1, Jesus said to the crowd and to the disciples, so he invites everybody in. And he says, the teachers of the law and the, uh, and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So, do not, uh, so you must obey them and do everything that they tell you, right? But do not do what they do. 
for they do not practice what they preach. They tie, uh, they tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. And Jesus gives them this visual, right? It's not that they're putting these great big old sacks of flour on the backs of, uh, of the people. They're, they're putting all these regulations, all these requirements that's not from God. They're just taking them and they're adding them on and it's crushing the people. It's literally crushing them. It's driving them into despair. And then Jesus uses the visual. And he says, listen, they won't even walk over with their index finger and help prop up a person that literally, literally is being crushed by it. And that hacked them. That hacked them. So what did he, what's he do in verse 13? He clarifies what he is angry about. Okay, so let's just pause and apply this into our life. There's going to be times in your life where you're angry. There's unhealthy ways of having anger. You can have fits of rage, right, where you just, your head spins off your shoulders and you, you blow up. You're like a volcano, right? You, you can have transferred aggression or transferred anger. That is, that something happened in work, the boss, the coworker, the whatever, and so you bring home that spirit of joy to the house, Right? Could be that you tried to get gas in the morning and you couldn't, the credit card didn't work and you had to walk all the way into the gas station to pay by credit card. You know what I'm saying? Right? And so you take that anger to work for your coworkers. Right? <clears throat> there are things that we can be angry about. And there are certainly things in our family dynamic that we can be angry about. Rightfully so. But how you process it and how you handle it is going to either be destructive or it's going to be enlightening to the people, right? So Jesus doesn't just spin his head off his shoulders and go crazy. He articulates why he's upset and then he addresses the people that he's upset about. And that's what verse 13 is. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. But he clarified it in verses, uh, in verses 1 and following, exactly what it was that he was upset about, right? So anger isn't a sin, but it's how you address it, how, how it comes out of you as to whether it's unhealthy or whether it's healthy. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Two of you got it. All right. Letter B in your outline. The second one is Jesus felt sadness, right? Jesus felt sadness. And uh, this is kind of an interesting verse. I've always kind of laughed at it internally. Um, Jesus' close friend Lazarus um, was, was going to die, and so Mary and Martha sends for Jesus to come to, uh, to heal him and to, to make him whole. And Jesus drags his feet. He doesn't show up. It's a, it's a short distance away. It takes him three days to get there. By the time he gets there, he dies, right? Now, Jesus knew Lazarus was going to be resurrected, right? He knew that. He knew that in the moment, he was going to speak him out of the grave, and everyone was going to clap and dance, and they were going to have a party. But in the midst of that, what's interesting is that Jesus, the shortest verse in all the Bible, Jesus, what did he do? He wept, right? He entered into that space with Mary and Martha, and even though he knew Lazarus was going to walk out of that with his grave clothes on, he still entered in, and he wept with him. Now I bring this up because a lot of people are like, oh, what do you mean sadness? I don't understand it. Sadness is looked at as a weakness. And that especially for some guys, that if we're if there's a sense of sadness, you're a weak person. And as a result of that, you don't actually experience the sadness in your heart. And you allow your heart to be hedged off or, or, or guarded, in a sense, of not allowing sad things to enter into your life. And maybe there's times where people say, do you even have any feelings? Right? You're so, you're so cold or hard-hearted. Right? Because and a, lot of, a lot of folks think that sadness is a weakness. But actually, sadness is something that we should experience. Because there's a lot of things to be sad about. 
right? There's a lot of things that happen to us personally. We live in a broken world. You know, there's a lot of things that, 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 that we can be sad about. And so that we need to make sure that we don't suppress that, that we actually, as Jesus, he wept. A close friend of his passed away. It was a sad moment. Even though something great was going to happen, Jesus was able to weep in, 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 in that moment with them. And so I think it's important that we recognize that there are times in our life where there's sad things that happen. And we need to make sure, and, and guys specifically for us, we need to make sure that we express that. That we ex- express that emotion. It's not, it doesn't make you weak. It makes you more like Jesus. Right? And so I think it's important for us to do. Y'all with me on that? Letter, letter C is Jesus felt fear. Right? Felt anger, sadness, and fear. And this isn't a complete list, but for sake of time. <clears throat> In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus knows that the cross is going to be coming. He knows that he's going to be hung up for the sins of humanity. And so in, in Luke uh, chapter 22, verse 40, uh, he withdraws about a stone throw away from them. He knelt down and he prayed. And verse 42, he says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. In other words, if, if you got a different plan and I don't have to get nailed to the cross, I'm game for that. I'm totally cool with that. Yet not my will, but your will be done. Verse 43, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Verse 44, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling on the ground. Okay, now this is an important part of what's taking place, and this is my opinion of what's taking place in our culture. There's a lot of things to feel anxiety about. There's a lot of things to feel fear about, have fear about. There's a lot of things to be frustrated about, right? I don't need to give you a list. You just need to use your imagination, but I can reel off probably six of them that are going on in our culture currently that is creating a lot of anxiety and a lot of issues in in our family's life and in in your life and in my life, right? So it's not that we will never experience fear. It's how you process that fear. What did Jesus do when he was was overwhelmed with what was going to take place? He cried out to his father. What's taking place in our culture today is that we are going through these difficult times and we're trying to numb it and mask it in our life. Hints. This is why de- uh, antidepressant drugs are being prescribed at a higher rate now than any other time. This is why illegal drugs are being used at a higher rate. Th- this is why uh, you-, you have folks who are going through depression, suicide, all those kinds of things. Folks who are... Um, recovering addicts are falling off the wagon after many, many, many years of being sober and clean, right? And the reason why is because there's fear, there's anxiety, there's worry, and they're not processing it in a proper way. And so what are they doing? They're numbing it down. They're drowning it, right, in their life. And what did Jesus do? He says, he, he, he cries out to his heavenly father, of what he's going to go through, right? So we're going to have seasons in our life where we're overwhelmed. We live in a broken world, right? And, and we're ruled by broken people, regardless of what government system that, that, that you're in in this country, in this world, I should say, right? So we're, we're, we're always going to experience these things in our world. How do you handle it? How do you process it in your life? Do you pause and do you really cry out to your heavenly father for the help and support and encouragement that he, that's what Jesus did? Or do we do it in an unhealthy way and we try to drown it, you know, whatever the, 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 the vice is that that person has in their life? Does that make sense? Number, letter D, so we don't go all negative. Anger, sadness, fear, Here's one, gratitude, right? Let's hear it for something good. Yay, yeah. <clears throat> and, and this is kind of a cool one, and this is, this is a um, self-confession, and so uh, if you watched earlier in the first service, you'll hear it, you'll hear it, you hear it on this one. This is where I'm at, right? <clears throat> like, have you ever had a time in your life where you're grateful for something, but you're fearful to express it because you're concerned that something may go wrong? Yeah? 
right? It's the, it's the other shoe's gonna fall kind of thing. Then that's how I feel about in-person worship, right? It's like, I don't wanna get too excited because I know what happened last time, right? So it's kind of like, we're in... Simmer down, right? And in our life, we do the exact same thing, right? In other things, because th- th- there's this idea that we're afraid that if we're too joyful about something, the old other shoe is going to fall and we're going to be in a mess. So what ends up happening is those times where we should have that heart of gratitude and we certainly ought to express it to the people around us, we don't do that. Right? We don't express that attitude of gratitude. And Jesus, in this one, you can go home and read this. This is one of the chapters I like. Uh, in, in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 10 talks about the harvest is great, the workers are few, and he goes through all these other things. And then in, in verses uh, 20, I think it is, Jesus is talking about your name written in the, in the Lamb's book of life. In other words, there's people who come to know Christ and they're saved, they have their name written in the Lamb book of life. And here, here's what Jesus says about that. He says, at that time, Jesus, full, uh, uh, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and have revealed them to uh, little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure, right? And I, and I think that that is great, all right? So let's begin to poke around a little bit. And this is the part where I want to encourage you to really start thinking about that 90% under the waterline. Because if you're going to have healthy relationships, this is what you're going to really need to begin to do. And that is to learn the importance of asking the why question, okay, which is, which is in your outline. And this is where I believe that God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit will reveal to you your areas of weakness. God, we do not worship a God of confusion. We do not worship a heavenly father who wants to hold out on his children. We worship a God who that when we earnestly seek him, he will reveal to us if we're really serious about him revealing it. Now, oftentimes he'll reveal those issues that we need to work through and we don't want to hear it. And I get that part. But if we're truly interested in the Spirit of God changing us and, and, and sanctifying us, then the Spirit of God will certainly teach and bring everything to your memory and, and make you aware or uh, have that aha moment. Are you with me on that? Yeah. So all through Scripture, we find this why question that Jesus would have encounters with people. And I believe that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The way he worked in the New Testament time is the way he works in our current period, right? He's not physically in front of us, but the Spirit dwells within us, and the Spirit is certainly around us to illuminate our mind. Are you all with me on that? So the Samaritan woman is, an, is a great classic example of bringing the, uh, the why question into the conversation and for her to really understand what her problems were. And you, you, you remember the story of the Samaritan woman. Jesus is at the well. It's midday. Women don't go to the well at midday. It's the hottest part of the day. She's there alone. That's not the way that it normally works. All the women would go in the morning. They would do their water together. They would all leave. It would be this festival, chit-chat time, and all this other thing. It was for protection and all these other things. But this woman is there all by herself. The disciples leave to go into town to get something to eat. And Jesus is there with a Samaritan woman. You're not even supposed to talk to a Samaritan woman. And Jesus is going to ask her a bunch of questions that's going to bring her to that 90% that's below the surface. And she is going to leave a changed person. Her whole life is going to be radically changed because he is going to bring her in touch with really the real problem that she's trying to mask. In fact, you, you remember the, the part where Jesus is getting close to what's going on in her life, and she wants to talk about where we're supposed to worship, right? It's a total deflection of what Jesus is doing. She's feeling uncomfortable because he is getting close. Why are you at the well all by yourself? How come you're here at the midday? 
Where's all your friends? Who's your husband? Oh, you have multiple husbands, right? What is the void in your heart that you're looking for? And so what, what does she do, it's, which is in your outline? <clears throat> she says in John, uh, John chapter 4, verse 20, our fathers worship on this mountain, right? Total deflection, because she doesn't want him to probe into that 90% that's below the level. And this is where if you're really honest with yourself and you truly love the people around you and you want to have healthy relationships, you have got to be willing to allow the Spirit of God to go to that 90% below the waterline to make you whole and make you complete. And so obviously she does that. Another classic example is not so much with the religious leaders but with the, disciple, with the followers, and so Jesus is having a conversation, and the religious leaders are having a conversation, and the religious leaders are saying, you got to wash your hands from the tip of your fingertip to the elbow. In order for you to be clean, that was one of the rules that they added on to people. Now, you should wash your hands before you eat and after you go to the bathroom and all that kind of stuff, but whether your hands are clean on the outside has nothing to do with spiritually what's going on the inside of you. And this is the point that they were making, and Jesus was frustrated with it. Because they were saying, well, if you just wash your hands, everything will be fine. And they were concerned about the outward side, and Jesus wanted to bring them to that moment where it's like, you know what? It's not about whether your hands have been clean. You should do that. But it's really about what you allow in to your heart, because that's what ultimately comes out of it. And so he pokes around, and it's not so much for the benefit of the, of the, of the religious leaders, because they're going to do their own thing, but for the disciples around him and the followers of Christ. And so in Mark chapter 17, or 7, verse 14, again, Jesus called the crowd to them. So he wants this to be a learning experience. Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean. They're worried about the exterior part of it, right? They're, they're worried about the outside. Go, uh, unclean by going uh, into. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. And then in verse 21, he says, uh, For from within, out of a man's heart comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, and so forth, right? And he says that's what comes out. It has nothing to do whether your hands are clean. And so Jesus is making a point as he's leading them to this discovery that it isn't about washing your hands. It's about what you're allowing into your heart, into your life that makes you unclean. If you allow the Spirit of God to work in your life and you have struggles, and you have relational conflicts with folks, and you truly allow the Spirit of God to give you those aha moments, I believe with all of my heart that he will. He didn't send his son just so someday we can go to heaven. He sent his son so we would be whole as we walked on this earth, that we would be complete as we walk on this earth. And when we are able to come in contact with why we're feeling the things and why we're doing the things that we're doing, then the Spirit of God gives us those aha moments and begins to give us the clarity that we need in life. So here's the challenge, and I'm going a little long. So here's the challenge, number three in your outline, is to practice self-awareness. To practice self-awareness. <clears throat> You're either going to be resistant, right, or you're going to be resigned or you're going to be resolved. You're going to be willing to allow God to work. And so there are two questions that I think that we need to work on if we're really going to work on ourselves. And remember, you cannot have healthy relationships if you are not healthy. It's impossible, it's absolutely impossible. So the two questions, how am I feeling right now? Okay, how am I feeling right now? And that is a question that oftentimes when I have families who come home from work and they have a lot of conflict coming home from work, I will actually walk them through that and in many cases have them park down the street before they even get home to walk through how am I feeling right now? Before I walk into the door, before I kiss the kids and kick the dog or whatever it is, how am I feeling right now? 
right? To come to terms with what it is. Now, if you're not a feelings person, then you can just simply write this down. What am I thinking right now? Because what I'm thinking leads to how I'm feeling and it ends up, happen- it ends up revealing itself in an action, right? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. All right, you got that? Letter B is why do I feel this way, right? Why do I feel this way? <clears throat> and as I said last week, remember, anger comes from fear, frustration, and hurt. If you feel angry, it's coming from fear, frustration, or hurt every single time. You just got to figure out what it is, all right? Write that down and look up here, because I don't know how we're going to end today. Just kidding. Again, my, my heart is... It pains me to hear about broken families, right? It hurts me. If, if you know, people who are believers, they die, they go to heaven, it's, it, it's sad, you miss them, you know, but you wish them well, it's like they're in glory, hallelujah. But it hurts, it hurts to hear conflict that takes place in family lives. And I think with all the stuff that's taking place, remember, I remember the very first Sunday of 2020, I said, 2020 is going to be clear. Get it, 2020? This has been anything but clear. This has been a train wreck from the word jump, right? And so we have all these things that are taking place in our world, right? And it's just causing an enormous amount of pressure in it. Hear me on this. The problems that are taking place are not causing everything that's going on. It's just speeding up the process of the relationships blowing up. Does that make sense? So, for instance, 34% of the families that have increased in divorce, it it didn't cause it. It just sped it up. I mean, it meant it's going to happen sooner. Right? And so what we want to do as believers in Jesus Christ is we want to have whole relationships, healthy relationships, relationships that honor Jesus Christ, whether that's in our home environment, our extended family environment, in, 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 in our work environment. And the only way that that's going to be possible is for you to be healthy. Every single one of us has 90% below the line. We all have levels of dysfunction. We all have problems. We've all learned different things from our upbringing and we've inherited some of them, some of them we invented ourselves. But God's desire is to make us whole so we function in a way that will ultimately glorify him. The world desperately needs to see Jesus. And guess where he's at? He's in you and you're it. And we model that in the world in which we live in. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time and Lord, for this again, this opportunity to gather together. And Lord, we're so grateful that we have the privilege and the opportunity to gather and to worship you. And Lord, you know my heart, you know my my desire to see relationships strong and healthy. And Father, I pray for the relationships that are here today, those who are watching online in our church family. Lord, we just hold them up to you. We pray that your healing hand would touch them, that those, those that, are, that are broken, that you would restore, that you would be honored and glorified in all the relationships, uh, Lord, that we have. Thank you, God, that you have given us the spirit of God that dwells within the life of the believer to reveal to us those areas of our life that needs to make the changes. And Father, I pray that you'll give us the boldness and the courage to make those changes in a way that will honor you. And Lord, we're just grateful for this opportunity. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed as we wrap up today, maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ. Maybe you're watching online today and you've never given your life to Christ. And I want to give you that opportunity because it truly is the first step of, 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 of wholeness is coming to know Christ as Lord and Savior. And we do that through little ABCs. It's not a formula. It's just kind of a way we simplify it. And that is to admit that we're sinners. We're all sinners. We've all uh, made mistakes. B is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross and that he rose again. And C is to confess him 
to be our Lord and Savior. And so if you're here today, you're watching, and you've never invited Christ into your life, just say, say this prayer silently as I say it out loud. Just say, Lord Jesus, today, I admit that I'm a sinner, that I've missed the mark. And I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And today, I confess him to be my Lord and Savior. Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you, Lord, for making me a brand new creation in Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So it is so good to see you guys, even though I'm only seeing the top part of your forehead and all that kind of stuff. But I want to encourage you as we come back next week. Next week will be week three. It, it is really the secret sauce of healthy relationships. It's something that, um, uh, it's something that you don't get automatically but it is, it is definitely given to all believers. And so I want to encourage you to come back, invite a friend to come on back. So it is great again to see you guys. You can exit one of two ways, out the back door. You can exit out the side door. Real quick, pay attention to the emails that are going out. We're in the midst of trying to figure out children, some type of children's worship that's going on. So we may see some adjustment in some times of our services, and so just make sure you're paying attention to uh, those times, all right? So God bless you all. Have a terrific week, and we will see you next week. Amen?